I am so excited because today I'm going to be interviewing Jim Matheson, founder of The Matheson Method. Today we're going to be talking about his method and how it works, but specifically we're going to be talking about Mustangs and the impact The Matheson Method can have on both their bodies, but also in the gentling process. We'll end the interview with how you could get started or potentially take it to the next level with a career. Without further ado, let's just get into it. All right. So thanks for joining me today. Um, I was wondering if you could just give me a quick overview of the Masterson method and what it is and how it works. Sure. Um, yeah. When I started doing this, I started, um, I was in the hunter jumper world. I was grooming hunter jumpers on the show jumping circuit. And then I started noticing these, you know, subtle changes in the horse while body workers were working on them. And I started experimenting with it and it turned into what I do now and at one point my wife said well you need like a 15 second elevator speech like to describing was it what it is you do because it's not it's really hard to describe if you you know to if you're going to go into it but so i was thinking well this is this would be the 15 second elevator speech it's a method of equine body work interactive body work where you learn to read and follow responses of the horse to your touch to help it release t tension in key junctions of the body that most affect performance Mm -hmm. So it's a method of body work where you use levels of touch that stay underneath the horse's, uh, their survival bracing response mm -hmm. uh, to help them release tension in the body. But the other key component to it is that you, you, you learn to read what the horse is telling you with its body language, subtle changes in body language, so that the horse tells you when it's, when you're under the bracing response and it tells you where you find, where it's holding tension in the body and it tells you when it's released the tension. Mm -hmm. And how did you, how did you get into that? Well, I was grooming hunter jumpers and, and, um, uh, I noticed that when trainers would have, uh, either massage therapists or acupuncturists or chiropractors work on their horses, their clients' horses, that there were these, uh, change, these, uh, changes in behavior that kind of went along with what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's what I was intrigued by. I was, there were two two kind of things that really inspired me to experiment with this. And one was uh, there was an old horse chiropractor from New Zealand who'd been adjusting horses for 40 years. And he'd learned from then another old horse chiropractor in New Zealand that had been adjusting horses for 40 years. But he lived in the States now and the, and the vets used to bring him out to the to the East Coast from the West Coast to um, to work uh, to treat their horses, you know, their clients horses. And so he was really, really good. He really knew how to read the horse really well. He used very long lever forceful techniques, um, but he really knew how to read the horse. And I actually wanted to do what he was doing. So whenever he was out at a show where we were showing uh, or we had our trainer had him work on our horses, I would follow him around. I drive him around to different barns, hold the lead rope and um, just to learn what he was doing. But he used, like I said, very long lever uh, techniques, which takes a lot of training to do, you know, it, it's using a lot of force, but he really knew how to read the horse. So, and for example, after he got an adjustment, like he would go to adjust the neck and pull in the atlas and, and a lot of the neck all at once. And he'd get the horse relaxed and he gave the head around and then he'd, then he'd uh, use a lot of force to do this huge adjustment. And then he would step back to what he called, see what the horse had to say. Mm -hmm. And he'd step back and the horse would just kind of have this dazed look in its eye and it would drop its head and it would start yawning so when it yawned that was his his sign that he got a good adjustment mm -hmm. so that was uh something that really got my interest like wow he's really the horse is telling him you know when it's working mm -hmm. and um that was one thing and then another thing uh, that happened uh, we were our barn was at, at a horse show in estes park and the trainer hired these two gals to do uh, equine massage on our horses and they started with uh, by running their hands slightly down the bladder meridian, which is a Chinese traditional Chinese medicine meridian that runs along the top line. And they did this to relax the horse and kind of connect with the horse. And I noticed that every once in a while, as they went over a spot, the, the horse would blink. It would be a definite blink. Mm -hmm. And I could see that the horse was blinking because it was feeling something under that. They weren't pushing. They were just running their finger over. So. I, I got them to show me how to do run where the bladder meridian was and how to do the bladder meridian. And when I was, as I ran down the neck, if I got a blink, I would just wait there and see what happened. And if I wasn't sure the horse was blinking because of me or because of something else, then I would go and run over that down that spot again. And if I got a blink at the exact same spot, then there was a correlation. Mm 
mm-hmm. between what I was doing and the horse was doing. So it meant something. Mm-hmm. And so rather than massage it, which I wasn't trained to do or rub it or poke it or anything, I was, I just wait there and do nothing, you know, keeping no pressure on the horse on that spot. And pretty soon the horse start to drop its head and it would lick and chew. And sometimes it would start to yawn repeatedly. Mm-hmm. And so that was like, wow, this is what the horse did when, when the, it, it got a good adjustment. Yeah. So something was happening. The horse was was releasing tension on its own. So that's how I got started doing this. And I started um, just messing with it. And first I started with that really light touch doing stuff. And then I realized that you can actually add movement to the techniques in a relaxed state. So rather than do a huge adjustment, I can gently, for example, wiggle my way down the neck using the nose and resting my hand on the vertebra of the neck. No pressure at all relaxed movement and wiggled my way down. And if I hit a spot where there was tension in, in that joint or junction, then mm-hmm. the horse would brace. And when the horse braced, I softened my hands because it doesn't work if, if they're bracing this. Mm-hmm. And when I softened my hands, the horse would release some of that tension. And I knew the horse released tension because it would either start to lick and chew or yawn. Mm-hmm. Uh, plus when I went to wiggle through that, there was no tension there anymore. So you could see the releases and you could feel when there was the tension was gone as you're asking for the movement. So the, eventually I, I just was able to go through the whole horse by either using very light touch and, let, and allowing the horse's nervous system to release tension in muscles and connective tissue. And then I can go through and ask for movement and find out where there was tension in the movement because the horse would brace and if I soften, the horse released the tension. So that's the long answer <laughs> to that yes. question. That's neat though. I mean, it sounds like a lot of trial and error. I mean, it's, it's all like- experiment. It was all experimenting and not in a bad way, not like the evil scientist, but you know, just uh, once I understood that if I didn't put pressure on the horse, it wasn't able to brace against me. Mm. So I could do all of the work by staying under the bracing response because horses survive by, by blocking out point pain and tension. You know, they have a certain level of later when I learned bigger words, sympathetic nervous activity that pr- protects them, the fight or flight. And so if they're in pain anywhere, they're not going to immediately start dragging their toe out in the wild because they go to the top of the menu and on, on the survival menu. And so if you can work in a way that you don't activate that bracing then and just wait and allow the horse the time to release the tension, they'll release tension on their own. And then when you run into tension asking for movement, rather than force your way through it, if you soften, they'll release the tension. So it's a little counterintuitive, you know, as humans, we think, well, if this doesn't work, I'm going to put more pressure on, but this is kind of the opposite. So part of that comes from the fact that I wasn't trained to do anything else, right? If I'd have been trained to massage that spot, then I would have massaged it and I wouldn't have been able to uh, allow the horse's body to release the tension. Mm-hmm. And the other part of that is I was I was lazy enough to wait and see what happened and slow down, you know. So yeah. la- lazy and uneducated. Yeah. So, I mean, well, it yeah. sounds like you're being led by curiosity, though. So yeah, um, just observing and yeah, curiosity. Yeah. yeah. It's and it's really cool because your method it isn't you're not getting in there deep, so it's something that you really can't mess up because your whole softening. That's the thing you, you, that has a built-in safety factor. Because if the horse is bracing against it, then it's not working. So mm-hmm. you have to soften. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so everyone knows. Um, and Jim, a lot of my viewers are they're into mustangs. Uh, they might have mustangs. They might want to get some mustangs, or they just might love them. But I think it's really important for anyone wanting to get into training animals or just to deepen that relationship with animals. Like learning how to read your animal is so important. So not only were you seeing performance benefits, I think it's really cool because it also builds the relationship with the animal by being able to read them better. So I think that's yeah. really awesome. Yeah, when you're working on horses, I mean, people that show horses or, or compete, um, they, they're they interested in the benefits and the improved movement and the mobility and, uh-huh. and the performance, and they'll hire somebody to do the work on the horse. But, but when ho- this interactive part, that's when horse owners started to take notice and wanted to learn how to do it because it does it does change your relationship with your horse and so the subtle the responses that we're looking for are so subtle like you know an eye blinking or a change in breathing or the lips twitching when you're going lightly over the horse I mean it learns you how to see it learns you (laughs) there's the uneducated part it teaches you how to (laughs) it, it teaches you how to it teaches you how sensitive the horse is and how much we're missing if we don't pay it slow down pay attention 
-hmm. like we're we're way past the point where the horse is all is in, internally braced mm -hmm. with a lot of the stuff we do with the horse mm -hmm. like the horse is going along with it but they're not they're only going along with it because the consequences are are worse if they don't go along with it mm -hmm. so it, yeah yeah and speaking of their sensitivity i know that sometimes like you're even Real, your um, softening is so much that you're not even touching the animal. Can you talk more about that and how that works? Yeah. So like I'll use the bladder meridian technique, which is just, it's just the same. The bladder meridian, it's like I said, it's a Chinese medicine meridian that runs, starts up at the head and it runs just along the top lane on each side. And so um, the reason that we use that is because um, it's the one that I learned how to read the responses on the horse. That's the only one I know. That's the main reason, to be honest. But it runs along the top line of the horse. It runs through the pole and atlas, the neck, shoulder withers, the back, the sacroiliac. The it, it it runs through all the key areas of the horse that you want to release tension in. It's easy to reach, um, and all the other meridians I've learned are associated with it. So it's a major meridian. Um, but when you're running down the bladder meridian and you're watching the horse's eye or its lips or its breathing, usually the eye blinks or the lips twitch if you go over a spot where they're feeling something, uh, where, they're, where they're actually what they're feeling is something that they've been blocking out to survive, you know? So if you run your hand pushing on it, you probably won't get any responses because they can block that out, but they can't block out no, no pressure. So mm -hmm. you're just, you're bringing their awareness to a spot where they're holding tension in a way they can't brace against it. So that's why it works. Like some horses, you can barely touch them. Some horses, that's too much for them. Like a horse that's head shy. If you go to put your hand up there, you you don't even get close and they pull their head away. Mm -hmm. um, if you back your hand away until you see their eyes soften just a little bit and stay at that distance, then their, their nervous system at some point will stop break, guarding against it and start to relax it. So mm -hmm. you're just keeping their awareness on an area in a way they can't brace against it. It's not like voodoo or anything. Mm -hmm. you know, just keeping awesome. the horse's attention on it in, in a way that that they can relax it and mm -hmm. not guard against it. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the other, you know, the big word is a sympathetic, uh, sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight part of the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And then the parasympathetic is the, they call it rest and digest and regenerate. You know, that's the part of the nervous system that keeps the body, um, functioning in a healthy way mm -hmm. so you're you, when, when they when they brace that's the sympathetic and if you back off so they can't brace then they start to you let go of the sympathetic and if you wait long enough the parasympathetic starts to take over and they start to let go of tension yeah I remember I think it was at the uh, the equine affair one of the first I think it was the first one you worked on I remember you were doing you started quite a bit it was hands off and you know, you can see the horse responding to that. And by the end, it, you know, let out quite a few yawns. So. Yeah, well, you have to to trust when you, when the horse is giving you a subtle sign, you have to trust that it's, that it, that it's because it's feeling something, you know, and you have to have the patience to wait and see if it's gonna, if something good is gonna happen or if not, mm -hmm. you know, that's why it's an experiment. Every time you're going over the horse, it's an experiment. You're saying, okay, I got a response here. So what do I do now? Well, if I'm not sure it's I'm on the right spot, go over it slowly again. And if it blinks at the same spot, then it's the right spot. Now, now what do you do? Well, nothing. Just keep keep the horse's awareness on it and have patience and allow the horse's nervous system time to relax. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned training that spills over into training. A lot of times we miss the horse. A lot of horse times the horse gets what we're trying to get it to get, but we miss it. Mm -hmm. And then we do it over and over and over again. And the horse, the horse already got it but we didn't get that the horse got it. So we're drilling the horse on something <laughs> that it already got. And it's wondering why I, why am I, uh, you're, I must, you, I must not have been doing what you wanted because you're making me do something else or do it over again. You know, and that's the horse isn't like thinking that like voicing it, but huh. a lot of times the horse will pick up uh, what we want, but we didn't pick up that they picked it up and then we go too far with it. Hmm. And yeah. then the horse becomes confused. And then the horse may end up doing it because it's been drilled into it and it doesn't understand what it's doing at all. It understands if it doesn't do it, it's going to get in trouble <laughs> or it's going to have to do it over and over again. And going into, again, going back to the Mustangs, um, you've said you've worked with, done body work on Mustangs. Have you noticed any similarities? Have there been any reoccurring areas of tension that you see? Yeah, well, like the, there's Mustangs that are like have 
uh, gone through training and that the owners have owned them for a long time and they're they're great horses you know um i i do i think they're they're really good horses but i didn't i do notice that there's there's usually they've become connected with their owners and they become they feel safe and comfortable in their in their job now if they've been doing it for years and years and years but they're always really careful they always um there's this thing a sense i get that they're take i can take care of myself that mustangs like the um, they they under there's this underlying thing where it's okay i can take care of myself mm -hmm. but they all still do stuff with you and still but uh, most mustangs that i've worked with that have been trained they're they've been trained really well and they're really good horses but they i get the sense that when i go to do body work on them it's completely new to them because um i'm looking for the subtle responses from the from the horse mm -hmm. and they don't often don't like that because they want to they survive by just getting let's get past right. that let's right get past that mm -hmm. and sometimes you find an area where they're uncomfortable and they really don't want to feel it you know so you got to back off even more till they're able to at least relax into it so there is that element of they've learned to really take care of themselves but the newer mustangs that are that haven't been trained you know i when i do horse expos like in sacramento at the western states they used to have a program where the the prisoners would um, yeah. work with Mustangs and it was good for the prisoners to learn how to, to, you know, relate and communicate and, and have a good experience with another creature. But, um, but, and then they would auction off the horses and then the horses, uh, sometimes people adopt, adopt or buy a horse that they're not able to handle. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it, the trainer was able to train them, but then, they go to an owner and they come back worse because mm -hmm. the, it was the owner, the person that got the horse was in over their head. Mm -hmm. And so that always bothered me. So I wanted to come up with some tools for people that would either buy or adopt these, um, these newer Mustangs, a tool that they could use to get the horse to trust them more. Wow. And cause it escalates, you know, you get a horse where you're trying to train it something and it, and it, and it resists it and it bites it, or it doesn't do what you want. And I've learned that it, the reason it doesn't do what you want because it doesn't understand. And we get mad at it thinking he's being a jerk. Well, they, they don't know how to be jerks. All they know how to do is to pr protect themselves when they're, in, when they're afraid. That's all they know. Mm -hmm. So they don't know how to be a jerk. So we think they're a jerk. And so we get rougher with them and then they come back even worse. So just to learn how to do the bladder meridian on a horse is, is slows you way down, allows you to, you learn how to wait and have patience with the horse and it's the and the horse will physically release tension, but also, like I said, it's part of training. The horse and will, horse will emotionally um, let its guard down and not be so fearful mm -hmm. of, of the human. So I've gotten so many emails over the years from people that say they just went on the website, learned the bladder meridian, or on YouTube. You know, it's on our website for free. You can mm -hmm. go learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. And they email back that they just have a new horse because internally this horse has been so fearful for years and years and years. Or it's got physical uh, discomfort in its body, and that's why it's been fearful. And then it releases it, and then they're like a new horse, just from not almost not touching the horse. What a, a I mean, how how good is that if you're working with a Mustang that's that's right. fearful? So. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Yeah, and I I started with the Bladder Meridian with one of mine, and but it was really cool because that's all I did. So simple, but to be able to get releases at the end i'm like oh yeah. I, <laughs> I feel good about this so. yeah the horse drops it head starts yeah. yawning and then it comes up and it comes over to you and gives you its nose you know mm -hmm. it, and i went out to it to lancaster to a rescue where they had some mustangs that had just recently been gathered and because uh, i wanted to you know experiment experiment with them and they had a little um mare that was in a a uh, small paddock and she had just the the small the short lead rope on her you know what do they call it? the lead rope like it's just a catch rope or something mm -hmm. a halter and you and so I didn't take the lead rope or anything I just went up to her and it was a small enough paddock that she had to be with me um but I was able and she was terrified she didn't want to be touched and so what I did I just got close and I went and put my hand up by her withers her neck and I just got to that point where she she was terrified, but I got to the point where I, I felt like if I back off a little bit at that point, I think I was that far away from her and she's like this. And then I backed off a little to her, her eye, her eyelash twitched, you know, 
her eyelid twitched and that was it. That was okay. That was the point where she's, um, the blink means they're brave. They're, um, the blink means they're feeling something, but they're unable to brace against it. So when I backed off till her eyelid twitched and I just waited there and I just waited there for like three or four or more minutes. And at one point she like dropped her head a tiny bit and then put her head up again. And so that was the release for me. Mm-hmm. And so that I went now farther down her withers and I did the same thing. I found a spot where I saw the eyelid twitch. And so I stopped there or maybe backed off a little bit. And after a couple of minutes, she kind of drops her head or her, she, or she lets out a breath of air. She never completely relaxed. Um, but I spent probably 20 minutes in there with her. I didn't go to the hind end because that would have been too much for both of us. But then I, and I, I left and I went and worked on some other horses that were more, uh, more um, used to people. And then maybe that afternoon after lunch, I came back into her little paddock and I did it and she was able to drop her head and lick and chew. So it took her that much time to process it. But I just wanted to find a tool that new owners could use to um, gentle their horses without any pressure at all and get the horse trusting them. And that was it. That's simple. Yeah. Yeah. Neat. And what kind of feedback were you hearing from people? Well, in the must in the in the Mustang, what's the, it's the tip program? I think I was yeah. I was wanted to get trainers oh. interested in that, but there there wasn't much response because they have a short period of time to train the horse, and then yes. they, and so there wasn't much much response from that. But I was hoping to, and I didn't end up doing it. But I wanted to make maybe a short video for them to give owners, you know, the people that buy the horses from them. Mm-hmm. or that get them at the auctions yeah. take this with you and then but there wasn't really there wasn't really interest because of the time element I think in that yeah timing. yeah so well the tip program is no longer but I think that would be awesome <laughs> so if my vote counts <laughs> yeah okay well, it counts <laughs> um and Continuing on the Mustang topic. So one of the things that I wanted to ask about was how some training practices with Mustangs might show up in the long term. For example, it's a pretty common practice for a Mustang to be haltered and a drag line attached while in the chute. So during pickup, the halter, it, throw the drag line on. People do it for a quicker start with their horse when they're on it, especially when they're on a timeline and you know, the horse is stepping on its rope and learning the pressure and release. And there's a, a variations on how people teach leading, but sometimes you can see it's pretty aggressive and hard tying to teach tying is another thing. I'm curious from a body worker's perspective, how does that show up down the road? Um, yeah, yeah a- so the, like there's three key junctions from a performance point of view that when they accumulate tension, um, if you can release that tension, you're going to see a huge improvement. And the first is the pole atlas. Uh, the first vertebra of the neck is the atlas. Mm-hmm. And the pole is the occiput. Um, that's probably the most important junction in the house. And then the other two are the neck shoulder withers junction where the neck joins the trunk and the forelimbs join the trunk. And then the sacroiliac and sacral lumbar where the hind limbs join the trunk. So for example, the hind, all the, the force exerted by the hind limbs transfers into the body at the sacroiliac. And then in the front end, the neck joins the trunk at C7, T1, and the forelimbs, the scapula join the trunk there. So that's a key junction. And the, but the most important of the three is the atlas, pole atlas junction. Anytime anything going on in the body is going to show up as tension in the pole and atlas. And conversely, tension in the pole and atlas is going to affect the rest of the body. And, and we don't realize how important that junction is, um, the atlas occiput junction. Um, when it becomes tense, it affects everything. Uh, not just mentally, but how the horse moves in its body. And when you see, when you release that tension, you'll see like a huge improvement in movement, no matter what's going in, in the bo- on in the body. But when a horse is, I mean, I've worked on like, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of horses that have, um, have been trained to not to, or that pull back. I ask, I ask, is this horse pull back? Yeah, he pulls back or he used to pull back. Mm-hmm. And it can have been a, you know, years ago that they stopped doing that or the horse stopped pulling back, but it's still there. Like you can tell the atlas is just jammed. There's no movement. There's no movement in here. And the horse, the horse has survived by just getting along, you know, they just keep going, but it, it has a huge impact when the horses, and I did that too. You know, I, I did a really good job of training our young Appaloosa mare to pull back when I was, you know, before I started doing body work, like she pulled back all the time. 
Um, but I used to hard tire and I, and I realized once I stood, started doing body work, how bad it was mm -hmm. to have a horse pull back with the, with the halter at, right there at C1 and C2, because it jams, it jams the vertebrae like, like this, jams them up. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, the short answer is it, you may train your horse not to pull back or you may not by hard tying it, hard tying it, but you're creating damage that's going to show up down the road. Mm -hmm. And I'll keep going on another thing. A lot of times I'll work on a horse and I can tell that it's had an accident in the past. It's either run into something or it's uh, flipped over backwards or it's just gone over on its side, you know, in the pasture. And or and another thing where these symptoms show up is a horse, if a horse has got its leg caught in the fence or something and struggles. And then um, when the incident is over, the horse trots off sound. There's nothing wrong, you know, let's say it's gone over gone over on its back oh no it's okay it's it uh you got its leg out of whatever oh yeah it's sound but it it shows up years 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 later mm -hmm. and it shows up as just being jammed up in the skeleton you know the, the um they just don't have the movement in the skeleton so everything else is moving around that jammed up spot but everything else is overworking because this part isn't working the way it's supposed to be working now mm -hmm. um and it shows up in the hind end as mystery. I call it mystery hind end lameness. If something's happened on the hind end, it's got a leg caught or it's run into a fence or something or gone over sideways. And in the front end, it just shows up as head shyness and um, unable to flex at the pole and just like wide eyed, you know, they're just like this. And they'll be really tight right in here too, behind the mandibles, those hard, hard muscles. And that whole junction of uh, the at pole, atlas and C2 and C3 can just be. Mm -hmm. So they'll be able to, well, there's the other thing. You know, you ask the horse to flex one way and it can flex one way and ask flex the other way it can't, or it braces, uh, it braces against the bit one rein or the other. Mm -hmm. And you think that's just the horse. Well, often that's something like that's happened. And now they can't bend, they oh, yeah. can't flex it the neck to the right, for example, so well. So you end up stronger in your right hand and then it gets tighter and tighter on the right. And pretty soon you have a horse that can't bend to the right very well at all, can bend a little to the left. Um, more comfortable on the left canter lead than the right so i mean there's all these signs that point to where these areas might be what i call jammed up mm -hmm. wow again long answer to a short question no no this is this is so helpful because i this mm -hmm. is such important things to be considering because like you said you might teach your horse to hard tie mm -hmm. but what mm -hmm. are the consequences down the road from that and my question is do you find that horses that have pulled back is are the issues that come from around that are they reoccurring is it something that can be fixed or is it permanent damage yeah, well it's something, something that you it's something that you can like it depends how bad they are you know like you just start peeling off the layers you do a little bit you get a little more loosened up and then you give it a little time and then you might get a little more loosened up and give it some mm -hmm. time if there's been damage then sometimes all you can do is release all the tension around it you know that they've been using to compensate for the problem and then but if there's damage, sometimes you can't you can't fix that. Mm -hmm. um, but you can do like you can help it though. Oh yeah, you can help it, and you keep you know what happens if there's damage? This the horse tight horse tightens up around where there's been damage to protect it, and then and not not just to protect it, but also to compensate for that part of the body not moving, and so they have to use extra muscles in other parts. So you can release all that tension, and then they'll move better. But then. If they have a, a problem like that, it, you have to manage it. You have to keep releasing the tension, work on them regularly to keep it from tightening up more and more. So it gets tighter and tighter. And then you, from say there's a little bit of damage or it's been really jammed up. So you work on it and loosen it up and take some layers off. And then that's as far as you can go. And then uh, it'll, it'll tighten up some more with work. And then you just release that tension. So it's like managing it rather than fixing it. Mm -hmm. but sometimes you can fix it sometimes you just gotta I don't like to use the word fix because yeah um, there's there's a lot of emphasis on fixing something like oh just do this and it's better and usually it's not just one thing it's one thing connected to another thing connected to another thing so um, yeah. And, yeah but what? another thing you asked about though before I forget the reason I have to do it while I think of it because I'll forget but I do know that a lot the Mustangs I've worked on, I think the gathering process is a pretty uh, physically rough process on them. So I think almost all the Mustangs I've worked on, even after years and years and years later, they, there's stuff going on in there that that they've been covering up probably from that process of uh, gathering them. You know, they'll run into the chute and they'll hit stuff and they'll, you know, 
they'll they'll fall. Um, and so that when the horse gets jammed up like that, it's it shows up later. You know, it's like their nervous system is jammed and things are just aren't moving the same. And they'll they'll go they'll get along fine. You know, for years and years and years, depending on their job. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's still there. Yeah. Unless you were, unless you're used to working on them and you realize, oh, this horse has crashed into something in the past because it's just not moving here. Yeah. And all these all these reasons that we've spoke on, like I just feel like what you're doing is so valuable, particularly for. I mean, my heart is with Mustangs, but I just feel like the work that you do is so valuable for those horses. So, um, yeah. And the trust, the trust that comes out of it, because it's non-invasive. It's not using any force to get them to release attention. And then the, the, there's this connection and trust that comes comes out of it. Because mm -hmm. when you learn how to read what the horse is telling you is one thing, but when they they get that you get what they're saying, that's when they really start to trust you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question I wanted to ask you is, how have you seen body work change over the years? How has it become, is it something that you're seeing growing interest in? Yeah, I think it started, you know, with like performance horses. I, there is a, a guy named called Jack Marr and his name's, I think his last name is, was spelled M-E-A-G-H-E-R, but it was pronounced Marr. And he was a, a human sports um, um, trigger point therapist. And so he's one of the early guys that started working on horses. And, uh, but it was taking a human modality and, and using it on horses. So um, when I started working on horses 20, 20 years ago or 23 years ago, there was equine massage was around and there was equine chiropractic, but it, most of that was human chiropractors working on horses. And except for some of these old timers, like the guy that I used to, to follow around. Uh, and they were basically traditional human modalities that are used on horses, which, you know, it works, you know, and horses respond really well to stuff like um, acupuncture and acupressure and, you know, even subtle modalities, they respond really well to. Um, but it's grown more and more. And I think more and more, you know, I think initially it was for performance horses or competing horses. And now it's horse owners want to do it, you know, just do you know work with their own horses and make their own horses feel better and connect more with their horses and, mm -hmm. and i'm glad it's growing you know because i want everybody to do it and this is a, this is something that's easy to to learn to do for a horse owner mm -hmm. like you don't have to learn a bunch of big words in anatomy i didn't know any anatomy when i started so it's not the anatomy isn't learning what the name of all the muscles are isn't important is just understanding how they work together and and even just in a basic way you know like if one area gets tight and the muscles get tight in one area that you know where they stop you know they contract and let go contract and let go to move a joint pretty soon they stop letting go and they're only moving the joint a little bit well that a joint or junction isn't functioning efficient fully so another part of the horse has to work harder to compensate mm -hmm. for this part so it's like keeping the horse balanced when you're training or conditioning a horse. When you're drilling a horse to do the same thing over again, you're drilling certain muscles to where they get tighter and tighter and tighter, and the rest of the body isn't equally being conditioned equally. Mm -hmm. Then you end up with a horse that's not moving in this area and overworking in this area. Mm -hmm. So that's just basic biomechanics. You don't have to learn what the muscles are. Like I, if I'm teaching, I just you know, this is the spaghettius ferrarius muscle over here. And that's the, <laughs> and the, you know, just make up names for the muscles. So people don't get so worried about understanding, learning what the Latin words are. It's just learning where the horse says it's got tension and when it's released it, that's how you start. I know you, you have tons of resources. I know, like I have, I have your book right here. <laughs> so, oh yeah. I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> you've got your book. <laughs> you've got so many, you've, I know you do seminars, workshops, you have a um, program to become certified in the Masterson Method. Why don't you talk a little bit about how someone could get started? I have a feeling that viewers watching this with their own horses, you know, might want to learn how to do this themselves. Yeah. Because it's something that anyone can do, but there's also, you potentially got a career path here. So can you talk a yeah, little bit? So, yeah, so like my, my uh, philosophy is I just wanted to share it and put it out there so people can learn how to do some of these techniques without spending money and then or a lot of money or any money, go on our YouTube channels, yeah. you know, and just learn how to do the bladder review and learn how to do some of the techniques. And then and you don't really hold uh, back there either. You're, it's, yeah, there's a ton on there. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. some people are going to take that and run with it, you know, and okay, this will work for me. And other people are, 
That looks like a moonshine jar you're drinking out of. Is that water? <laughs> yeah, it's a mason jar. <laughs> okay, no. got it. All right. <laughs> Not exactly. I don't know. You're up there in the woods in Vermont. I didn't know if they made moonshine. <laughs> no. Anyways, so so like you just take take something and try it and see if you like it. And if it works for you and it's working and you want to learn more, then you come and you then go buy the book, you know, or the video that, that goes with the book. And then Take that and learn what you can from that. And then if you want to learn more, then you can do a weekend workshop, a weekend seminar or clinic. Mm -hmm. And and we have those all over the country now because you, you know said, we've been you said there's one coming to New England area maybe soon. Yeah, at the at the Equine Affair, we got names of people that are wanting to host and then and um awesome. and uh so if you keep an eye on our calendar page on our website at mastersmith.com, you can see if there if any are coming up near you. Mm -hmm. So Awesome. Um, yeah, but that was a philosophy. Just try it. And if you want to learn more, learn it, go do this. And if you want to learn more, go do that. And then if you want to keep going after the weekend, we have a five day advanced course. And these are all at barns or facilities where the horses are there. You learn better working on somebody else's horse. We're too close to our own horses. Like I even have trouble working on my own horses because they know me too well and I know them too well. Mm -hmm. And if you have any agenda when you go to work, on the horse they're going to pick up on it and they're going to brace against it so i've learned now but for a long time i went to work on my horse and it was yeah i know where you're tied i'm going to fix that and the horses sent pick up on that and they guard it they just brace against it internally so for most people it's better to work on learn on other horses so anyways you go to a facility and you do the weekend then if you want to do more you do the advanced five day and that's usually a a course where we go to a different barn every day or every other day so you're working on lots of different horses and learning uh, more advanced techniques mm -hmm. and then if people want to go on there's a field work program to become certified and uh, it takes usually a year or a little more to go through that process of doing case studies and we have mentors that you'll email your case studies to and get feedback and then you work you meet up with a coach three times during that process to work one-on-one -on -one. and um then there's a final certification that uh, two day course and it takes, you know, it's pretty intense course it takes because there's a lot of practice involved because the goal is to become really good at the techniques, not to just, you know, get a piece of paper that says you're certified. And then when you're certified, it's just shows that you've become proficient in our techniques. And if a lot of people do it because they want to go out and work on horses for a living, or they already work on horses, they want to add tools to their toolbox. And some people just do it because they want to really, just get good at good at it and get certified. Yeah. So every and every state has different laws regarding e this falls into the category of equine massage. And um, in the past, it, there have been, you know, a lot of states technically you you have to be working under a veterinarian or you have to be a veterinarian to do equine massage, even though they, they never learned to do equine massage in vet school. But that's slowly changing and more and more states are 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 loosening up on that and to be honest more and more vets are are loosening up on it they're happy to have uh if an owner wants their horse to get equine massage they're happy to have it done so it's just good to be aware of you know that um if, if you any certification in equine massage or any modality it's not like you're going to go through a course get a certificate hang up your shingle and people are going to be lined up at the door that's not how it works you have to go out there and start working on horses and uh, you kind of pick up clients one horse at a time because people don't want it and and people won't just go look and uh, see a card at the feed store or the tax store equine massage they they want to know who it is you know so a lot of people expect they'll just put up their cards and people start calling well usually people it's word of mouth you know people want to know uh, you know do you know this person would you recommend them uh, oh yeah they did a really good job on my horse yeah do you build your business by word of mouth yeah, but I think it is really cool. So I know someone who's going through your certification program now and she's come out and worked on my horses and it's been incredible to walk. She's done an amazing job. And, but the, the results that you see from like in a session, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it sold me and now I'm singing phrases. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so. it's about results. You know, when I was working yeah. on show horses, it was about results. So they won't hire you if you, you can know every muscle in the body. And if your horse isn't moving better afterwards, they're not going to call you back. So it's about getting results in movement, but it's also the cool thing about this is you get results as you're working on the horse. You can see when when the horse re releases tension. You can see mm -hmm. it drop its head and lick and chew or start yawning, and then um, 
it's just it is pretty amazing and yeah. i think the reason it gets results is because you're following what the horse is saying need it mm -hmm. needs you're not following what you think it needs that's one reason i caution people about getting too caught up in the anatomy because then you end up oh yeah i know the horse is probably going to need work here and here because and then if the horse doesn't agree then you're not really doing as you're not being as effective mm -hmm. as if you're following what the horse is telling you well yeah. That is awesome. I have really appreciated this conversation. It's I think you've oh, given good. I think you've given a lot of really helpful just insights here. And I, I'm excited about what you've done. I'm excited I discovered it. And I definitely want to take yeah. your start with your weekend course. And yeah, uh, just start. You just start and do that. And then if you want to learn more, you don't have to guy do the whole shebang. You just mm -hmm. go along and learn to learn what you want to learn. And then if you want to learn more. Well, you caught me on a really talkative day because the weather's been really really terrible outside for like a week and, uh -huh. and I have all this energy. So, yeah, well, great. Um, one last thing I did want to ask about for those who are interested in training horses someday, I think this is a great, a great, if you want to train horses, I think this is great because you're learning how to read responses. You're learning to, yeah, just read that of the horse. But for people who don't have horses, you also show videos in a book on dogs, right? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more about a little bit about that and how, a prey animal differs than a predator. Yeah, see, when I was working on horses, I thought, well, you probably won't work on dogs because horses are prey animals and they cover up pain or discomfort differently than a than a predator. But then I started working on dogs because everywhere you go where there's horses, there's usually dogs. You know, any barn barn doesn't have a dog probably isn't isn't a real barn <laughs> but anyway so I started working on owners dogs and I realized that it works that works the same there's um the the responses are the same the releases are the same the difference with dogs is they're a little more interactive with humans so you have to read through that you know behavior a horse is standing there it's usually quiet or it will quiet down after you start you give it time to um, but dogs they're interactive with humans so you have to read through that you'll search down the bladder meridian and then you'll get a blink and then immediately after you get the blink the dog will look at you know, like it'll uh, you know I love you I love you I love you you know that yeah you gotta breathe through all that activity and but if you stay there and wait long enough it'll start to yawn and then it, uh, it'll often the dog will after 20 minutes just lay down and go to sleep that's mm -hmm. another difference so mm -hmm. um but so I was trying to figure out well, what's going on here and it's really not about the dogs still flee, horses still attack. It's just that on the spectrum, dogs are more, predators are more aggressive and prey animals are, are, are less aggressive. So, but they still have the same sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. And uh, so, but the, the point is it works, you know, so we can try to figure out, well, why and get make guesses about why does it work on dogs and horses? But the first thing is it works. And it, it's really helpful with older dogs that, you know, they get sore in the lower back and they have trouble jumping up on the couch or something. And I mean, after 20 minutes, I'm not saying that this is going to help every dog, but uh, it, I've seen some pretty amazing changes in dogs that were just like, well, he's getting old. He can't jump up in the car anymore. And then you do some work on them and they bounce up into the car. Wow. But, you know, if they're old, their back's going to get sore again after a while. So you're going to have to work on them some more and manage manage it. So Well, that's cool. Yeah. If someone doesn't have a horse, they can practice on a dog. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, so the the, the publisher that, you know, that uh, I did Beyond Horse Massage, I don't know, I think in 2011. And so after about five years, the publisher said, well, we need you to do a dog book. And I kept putting it off because I'm busy with horses, you know, and I'm, and I love dogs, but I'm not a dog expert, but you, you don't have to be an expert. You just have to be an expert in reading the animal's responses and following them till, so they release tension. Mm -hmm. So just this last year, I finally did the dog book with the publisher. And so we'll see. Yeah. And go ahead. If you would just share your website where people can find your stuff. Yeah. It, well, it's mastersandmethod.com. Mm -hmm. And, and you'll then, find the horses, the dogs, the horses. Yeah, the horses and the dogs. And then yeah. we have lots of YouTube videos out there. So you yeah. can try things and see if they work for you. And if they work, then you want to learn, learn more, then there's more. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you so yeah. much for this. You're welcome. Yeah, it was fun to run into you at the Horse Expo. Yeah. But,